This morning, we're, we're starting a new series uh, on the book of First Thessalonians. And I want you to imagine yourself just for a moment in the bustling streets of the ancient Roman city, Thessalonica. A vibrant city where the air was thick with tension and danger for any who would call themselves followers of Christ. In the first century, being a Christian was a, a pretty perilous journey. You know, fraught with persecution and uncertainty. The early believers faced the wrath of zealous Jews and the scorn of angry Greeks and the merciless hand of Roman authorities. They endured stonings and beatings, crucifixions and torture, all because of their allegiance to Jesus Christ. And in the midst of this turbulent landscape, the Apostle Paul planted a seed of faith in the hearts of the people of Thessalonica. It was during his his second missionary journey around 51 AD. But Paul's work didn't end with the planting of this church. That was really just the beginning. Shortly after, he penned a letter to these fledgling believers, a letter pulsating with love and encouragement and unwavering hope. Through Paul's words, we catch a a glimpse of his pastoral heart and deep concern for the spiritual well-being of the Thessalonian believers. He urges them to live lives that will honor God, to love one another fervently, and to shine as beacons of light in a dark and sinful world. And moreover, amidst his exhortations and encouragement, Paul tenderly comforts his beloved brethren with the promise of resurrection and the hope of the inevitable return of Jesus Christ. With each word, he just stirs their hearts to readiness, reminding them to be vigilant and prepared because uh, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You know, they have no idea when it's going to be. And, and that, let me pause there just for a second because this isn't really scripted in my, my sermon. Sorry, Isaac. But um, everybody's all riled up about this uh, eclipse going on. To, like, and, and I'm seeing people trying to connect it to Bible prophecy and that sort of thing and saying that this is a sign of the end times. Guys, it's just an eclipse. It happens like every 17 years or something like that. Not a big deal at all. Please don't try and connect that to some Bible prophecy about the return of Christ, which Paul says, and Jesus himself said, no one knows the day or hour. It's not going to be something where you can just go outside and look, hey, there's an eclipse. He must be coming this week. So let's just forget about all that stuff. But through the centuries, through the centuries, ever since Paul wrote this book, and, and it's, it's been hundreds and hundreds of years since Paul's ink first touched parchment, the essence of his, his message remains as vital uh, and relevant today as it was first written. In a world marked by uncertainty and division and moral decay, we find ourselves grappling with a lot of the same trials and tribulations that the Thessalonians did. You know, like them, Christians today, they face persecution. We endure hardship. We navigate the complexities of living out our faith in a culture that is often in opposition to it. And thus, Paul's timeless exhortation serves as a a beacon of light in the darkness of our modern age, guiding us toward a a deeper understanding of our identity in Christ and empowering us to stand firm in the midst of whatever life throws at us. So with that in mind, I want to invite you to join me for this five-week series through this powerful epistle. And as we embark on this journey through 1 Thessalonians, we will glean wisdom and insight from the timeless truths contained within its pages, and our hearts will be stirred to stand firm in our faith, to to love relentlessly, and to live in eager anticipation of the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have a Bible or an app on your phone, please join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, In this introductory chapter, Paul highlights five areas of life and faith, not three or four this time, but five areas of life and faith in which the the Thessalonian believers stood firm and, and consequently stood as an example for generations to come. Now first, Paul praises them for standing firm in their efforts. 
their efforts. The Christians in Thessalonica were hardworking, hands-on people. Paul writes to them starting in verse 2 and going into verse 3, We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here, and really woven all throughout the entire book of of Thessalonians, Paul praises the Christians here for their, their hard work, their activity, their deeds. This was a church that was doing things. The NIV translates this phrase, your work produced by faith and your labor prompted by love. I like that. Faith in Jesus ought to manifest in work. And our love for God ought to to prompt us to to do things, to labor for His kingdom. And the the great thing though is when your love or your labor that is, is motivated by love, it really doesn't feel like effort. And, and nothing really illustrates this better than uh, the sweet story of Jacob and Rachel. You guys remember this story from the Old Testament? Um, there's this cute little love story about Jacob and his beloved Rachel. And Jacob, when he first meets her, he's, he's sitting by this well outside the city of Panoram. And normally what happens is Uh, all the shepherds would come out to water their sheep at the same time because there was this massive stone that sat on top of the well. That was to prevent, you know, other people from getting into it. And, and so they would all have to work together to lift it and move it so that then they can then water their sheep. Well, Jacob's sitting out there by himself and the first shepherd to show up is this stunningly gorgeous shepherdess, you know, the most beautiful shepherdess that he's ever set eyes on. And Jacob just immediately, he falls in love at first sight. He jumps up and single-handedly shoves that big giant stone off of the well. I don't know if he was trying to impress her or if he was just like hyper-motivated to be, you know, there for her and encourage her. But anyway, she's, she is grateful that he does this. They talk back and forth. He moons over her for a couple of months and he, he wants desperately to marry this girl, but he doesn't have enough money for an engagement ring, let alone a dowry. So he goes to her father, uh, Laban, and he says, listen, I will work for you for seven years for your daughter, Rachel. And, and Laban agrees. And the Bible says that uh, Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that a beautiful story? And and similarly, just as Jacob's love for Rachel prompted him to undertake seven years of hard labor without hesitation, our love for the Lord should inspire us to serve Him wholeheartedly in His kingdom. Uh, The story of Jacob and Rachel illustrates how labor, when motivated by love, feels less like obligation and more like a joyous expression of the heart. And in the life of the church, every member has a, a unique role to play in furthering God's kingdom. Whether it's you know, serving in children's ministry or volunteering at Camp Mac or teaching a Sunday school class or participating in the outreach team or the fellowship team or, or you know, whatever it is, each of these acts of service is a, a labor of love. And we're blessed here at the Grove to have a, a multitude of volunteers who selflessly give of their time and talents. However, if, if you're not one of those people yet, then I want to encourage you to follow the example of the Thessalonians and, and get involved. You know, your contribution, no matter how small it may seem, is significant in God's eyes and it's essential for the flourishing of, of His church. So as we reflect on the Thessalonians' commitment to faithful work and loving deeds, I pray that our own efforts will be similarly fueled by love and inspired by faith. But furthermore, Paul reminds the Thessalonians to stand firm in their election. Their election. Um, and I'm not talking about a presidential election. In the, the rich tapestry of Paul's words, we find this, this very comforting notion here in, in the next verse. Verse 4, he says, We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you 
and has chosen you to be his own people. Paul reminds them of their status as God's chosen ones, like a a gentle embrace in this world of uncertainty. And yet few issues cause more confusion and I think conflict within the church amongst Christians than this this notion of election. What does it mean to be chosen by God? And there's there's essentially two camps within the argument. There's, There's those who subscribe to the idea of unconditional election, which is it's a kind of a tenet of Calvinism. It's the belief that, that uh, we choose God because he chose us ahead of time. Like he chooses us, and because he chooses us, we choose him. Um, and then there's the conditional election, uh, which is a tenet of Arminianism, and that's the belief that you know, God chooses us because we chose him. You know, we choose him, and he chooses those who choose us, choose him. I don't know. Choosy moms choose Jif. That's all I know. <laughs> Uh, but there's a lot of choosing going on here. And, and honestly, you know, Christians debate back and forth about this kind of stuff. All of us agree that God is sovereign and that humans have free will. And it's just how, do you, how you reconcile those things is, is the question. Which one's correct? Honestly, I, I don't care that much about how it works. I'm just glad that it does. You know, that God loves us and chose us to be his people ought to inspire us and fill us with gratitude. You know, it fills us with this sense of self-worth and value and, and motivates us to be the kind of people that He's chosen us to be. You know, to understand the significance of being chosen by God, just think of all the times that you haven't been chosen in life. You know, maybe you weren't that coordinated as a kid. You know, maybe you were that one that was always picked last for the kickball team. And, and even then, you know, you were only picked because there was no one else left standing there on the wall. Or, or maybe you, you weren't chosen for the football team. Or, you know, maybe you, you, you got passed up for the promotion or turned down for the date. You know, you'll likely never be elected president. You're not going to be chosen to compete on American Idol. But you were chosen and elected by God. And unlike the kids in gym class, you know, God didn't just shrug his shoulders and say, you know, well, I guess I'll take Nate because no one else is picking him. You know, (laughs) he actually wants you to be on his team. To be chosen by God means to be his first and best choice. Why did God choose you? Is it your dashing good looks or your irresistible personality, your unparalleled wit and wisdom? None of the above. God chose you because he loves you. That's what Paul says. God loves you and chose you. Let that truth sink in. Embrace your election by God and let it fuel your sense of of purpose and identity. Let it inspire gratitude and confidence in our hearts. Stand firm in the knowledge that God loves you and has chosen you as His own. And may that assurance empower you to live boldly as the person that God has uniquely chosen you to be. Now next, Paul praises the Thessalonians for their endurance, for standing firm in endurance. As Paul continues, he touches on what what is a a sensitive but significant subject. He says in verse 6, So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. And in this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. Now Paul details this notion of suffering, specifically the the Thessalonians' suffering for the sake of the gospel, uh, a little bit more in chapter 2. He talks about exactly what their struggles look like. Uh, And we'll get to that next week. But but for now, this verse, uh, it, it reminds us that the the Christian journey is not immune to trials and tribulation. In fact, just the opposite. Embracing the message of Christ often invites opposition and hardship. The Thessalonian believers' response to suffering serves as a powerful example for us today. You know, their willingness to embrace the gospel amidst suffering is a testament to their deep-rooted commitment to truth and righteousness, you know, regardless uh, of the consequences. They could have simply dismissed Paul's teaching as nonsense, but they didn't. 
They could have you know, abandoned the faith and given up as soon as the going got tough, but they didn't. They stood firm in what they believed to be the truth. They stood firm even though it meant facing severe suffering. So are you, like the Thessalonians, willing to embrace and proclaim the truth of God's Word even in the face of of hatred and hostility from the world? And what's more, are you willing to do it joyfully? (laughs) Enduring suffering with joy is not a natural inclination, but it is a mark of true discipleship. It requires a radical shift in perspective, learning to view our trials not as as obstacles to be avoided, but as opportunities for growth and, and deeper intimacy with God. The incredible truth is you are never more like Christ than when you are suffering for the sake of the gospel. You're never more like Christ than when you're, you're enduring the struggles and hatred and hostility of the world because of His name. The Thessalonians' imitation of Paul and Jesus Himself in, in their response to suffering is a powerful testament to their faith and faithfulness. And their example inspires us to stand firm in endurance, trusting in God's faithfulness, even in the midst of life's struggles and storms. And like I said, we'll, we'll circle back to this idea next week. But moreover, beyond their efforts, their election, and their endurance, the Thessalonians also stood firm in evangelism. Evangelism. Paul uh, has already praised them for their, you know, their faithful work and their loving labor. But one especially important Work of the church is the work of spreading the gospel, sharing the message of Christ. And that's what he praises them for here. In verse 8, he says, And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For everywhere we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. The Christians in in Thessalonica were an evangelistic church, ringing out the message of Christ. They persistently shared their faith with other people, creating more and more believers, more and more disciples. Some people, you know, we hear the word evangelism and we have an immediate negative reaction. Maybe you think of like hokey TV evangelists or, you know, old fashioned door knocking campaigns or, or maybe even those street evangelists with the signs that, you know, are interviewing people on the street and you think, well, that's not for me. I just couldn't do that. I'm reminded of this old, um, Peanuts cartoon though, and I, I've probably shared this with you once or twice before, but, but it's, it's this adorable story where, where Lucy goes up to Charlie Brown and she says, I would have made an excellent evangelist. Charlie Brown's like, oh yeah, why is that? And she says, well, just today I convinced the boy in line ahead of me that my religion is better than his religion. And Charlie's like, well, how did you do that? And she says, I hit him over the head with my lunchbox. (laughs) Not probably the best tactic, but there are so many different opportunities and so many different ways for us to share our faith. You know, uh, whether it's, you know, telling your friends about the difference that God has made in your life, or sparking spiritual conversations with people randomly, relatives, coworkers, or just inviting neighbors to attend church with you. You know, we live in a culture where the majority of people still identify themselves as Christians, depending on the survey you look at, anywhere from like 60 to 80 percent of people identify as Christian. But the vast majority of those people have been so far removed from church and the Bible that they really don't know what it it looks like or means to live the Christian life. And despite the the hatred and hostility toward Christians that I think has prevailed over the past 20 years or so, I think we're starting to see a rise in openness to Christianity. Uh, According to Tom Rainer's book, The Unchurched Next Door, 82% of our friends and family that don't attend church are at least somewhat likely to attend if they were invited by a friend. So 82% of the people that you know who don't go to church anywhere, if you invited them, they would at least consider it, is what that says. They would at least consider it. And I, and I think there's a, a significant percentage that would say yes if they were invited by a friend. The problem is not that there aren't enough people out there who are open to the gospel or open to attending church. 
The problem is there's not enough Christians willing to share their faith. Because the same study found that in any given year, only 2% of Christians invite someone to church. So in our congregation, that's about two people in 2024 that will invite someone to church. I think we can do better than that. I think we need to do better than that. So let's follow the example of the Thessalonians and let the message of Jesus ring out from here to everywhere. And finally, in addition to everything else, Paul praises the Thessalonians for standing firm in expectation. As Paul begins the or brings the, the first chapter to a close, he reminds the Thessalonians in verses 8 through 10, you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. The Thessalonians spent their lives with an eye on the clouds and an ear for the trumpet. They waited expectantly for the day of Christ's return. And sadly, I think many of us have lost that sense of expectancy. You know, the return of Jesus is a vital part of God's redemptive plan for humanity. History is not just this endless succession of, of meaningless circles, but a, a directed movement toward a great event, the second advent of Jesus. Christ's return was foretold by the prophets, proclaimed by angels, and promised by Jesus himself. In John 14, 3, he does his best Arnold Schwarzenegger impression saying, I'll be back. Um, he actually said, I will come back, but close enough, right? And then the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, Christ will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting on him. Are you eagerly waiting on Christ? Are you standing firm on the promise of His return? It's a question that I think gives a lot of us pause, isn't it? We might feel a twinge of hesitation knowing that the, the right answer is yes, absolutely. But if we're honest with ourselves, do we truly feel that anticipation deep down? Do our actions reflect that hope? You know, too often we find ourselves consumed by the, the here and now, the busyness of life, and we neglect the eternal. Not the Thessalonians, though. They looked forward to Christ's return with eager expectation. The hope of His return carried them through troublesome times and, and spurred them on to more loving deeds and faithful works. We'll circle back to the second coming in in a few weeks as Christ's return is the central theme of the fourth chapter in 1 Thessalonians. But for now, let's just stand firm as we look forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven. And as we draw our time together to a close, let's, let's really consider the, the powerful truths that, that Paul unveils just here in this first chapter. You know, we've seen how the Thessalonians stood firm in their efforts Embrace their election with joy, uh, endured suffering uh, with unwavering faith. They passionately engaged in evangelism and they eagerly expected the return of Christ. These timeless principles challenge and inspire us to follow in their example and to stand firm in our faith, to live with joy and expectation of Christ's imminent return. May we carry these truths with us as we go from here to wherever empowered by the Holy Spirit to live lives that honor God and advance His kingdom. Next week, we'll continue through Paul's letter to the Thessalonians as we seek wisdom and inspiration that we need in order to stand firm in our faith. But for now, wherever you are on your faith journey, I want to prompt you to just take the next step. Whatever that happens to be. Maybe for you that means embracing your election or finding a place to serve in the church. Maybe it means uh, standing up for the truth uh, in the public square. Maybe it means you know, sharing your faith with a friend or a family member. In any case, now's your chance to take that step of faith and to stand firm in your faith as we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.